60 kilometers from Tehran, at around 2 p.m. on Friday the 27th of November, a black sedan car was hit by an unknown object. Mozen Fakrasadeh climbed out of his bulletproof car to inspect the damage, and it was at this moment a remote-controlled machine gun mounted on a blue pickup truck began firing at Fakrasadeh and his convoy. The car then exploded, and Iran's top nuclear scientist was dead. This is how the Iranian media reported the assassination of one of the country's most shady and unknown figures. Few images exist of Fakhrizadeh in the state media, and he has given even fewer public speeches. However, this is not to underestimate the nuclear scientist's importance. Western intelligence services view him as one of the most dangerous men involved in Iran's quest for a nuclear weapon. But this latest bloodshed is much bigger than one man. The attack is just one of a string of strikes on Iranian officials in recent years, which have infuriated the Islamic Republic. Eleven months ago, the second most powerful man in Iran and the head of the elite Quds force, Qasem Soleimani, was killed in a US airstrike. Although it is currently unknown who is behind the latest assassination, Iran has blamed Israel for the sophisticated attack. In response to the remote killing, Tehran has vowed to ramp up their nuclear enrichment program and said they will avenge what they call an act of state terror. Ever since the pro-Western Shah of Iran was deposed in 1979 by a radical Islamic Republic, relations have been difficult between the United States, its allies and Iran. More recently, even after Donald Trump lost the 2020 election, he still sought options to attack Iranian nuclear sites as recently as the 12th of November, though was dissuaded by allies. With assassinations, nuclear weapons programs, and tougher and tougher rhetoric on all sides, the question remains, are we heading to a new war in the Middle East? To answer this, we must understand Iran's nuclear ambitions. I think the, the issue of Iran and the bomb is one that actually goes back to the Shah's time. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, Iran started investigating the possibilities uh, back in his day. Uh, and it's been a consistent part of Iranian policy. In fact, arguably, were the current regime to uh, be replaced by any kind of nationalistic Iran regime, there would still be a push uh, to Iran getting a nuclear weapon, primarily for great power reasons. The idea that Iran is an ancient civilization that has um, a legitimate state in the region and in the world and can uh, you know, utilize that with, with this nuclear weapon. But it's no doubt that this regime sees it as more than simply a grandeur issue. But this regime, which has always uh, felt under pressure and felt, um, remember, of course, it's a revolutionary uh, regime, uh, it wants to create revolutions abroad, but it's always aware that it might have a revolution uh, at home or caused by others. So it sees the achievement of a nuclear weapon not simply as a statement of uh, world power status, but also as a key uh, defensive or indeed offensive weapon uh, to be used against neighbours or great powers threatening it. And of course, in that context, we're talking about um, the local if you like, Gulf states, um, Israel, and of course, the US. This all changed in 2015. President Obama, along with China, Russia, France, the UK and Germany, signed a deal with Iran to limit its nuclear capacity, for example by reducing its program to enrich uranium, which is a key part of putting together a nuclear missile. However, as soon as the deal was signed, critics said it was simply pushing the problem down the road. And the interesting part of this, of course, was that it was time limited. So um, you had various terms of 10 and 15 years, depending on which of the uh, levels you're talking about. Uh, when it comes to uh, enrichment. In return for this, for this sort of cutting back on its nuclear ambitions, Iran would get sanction relief. The point was Iran essentially got money in exchange for cutting its capabilities uh, in nuclear terms. Yet within a year, Obama's dream of peace and working with Iran was shattered. Against all odds, Donald Trump won the presidency and the eight years of democratic control over the White House was over. With the new Trump era, the United States drastically changed its policy towards Iran. Donald Trump immediately declared Obama's deal as a horrible one-sided deal that should have never, ever been made. It didn't bring calm, it didn't bring peace, and it never will. In 2018, the Trump administration left the Iran deal, causing international confusion. Not only did Trump pull out of the Iran deal, 
but a policy of maximum pressure was put on Tehran. Sanctions were increased, tough rhetoric was used, and the president even ordered an airstrike on the second most powerful man in the Islamic Republic, Qasem Soleimani. And we take comfort in knowing that his reign of terror is over. So would Iran carry on complying with the deal? After 2018, what is indisputable is that the European um, component parts of the treaty, the UK, Germany and France, were determined to keep it alive. And rather than say, look, the US is out, we need to renegotiate with the US a new deal that everyone's happy with, their line was, well, the US has gone off on one, essentially. Uh, Trump is, you know, kind of uh, behaving outrageously. We will try and work with the Iranians to keep this going. In exchange, the Iranians were supposed to keep to the terms of the deal. But in the last two years, Iran has broken every single bit of it, basically. And they are enriching uranium to a much higher level than the 3.67% they're allowed to under the treaty. Uh, they are developing huge stockpiles um, of uh, uranium. They are, uh, you know, they've reopened centrifuges that were supposed to be closed. Basically, Iran is now cheating on the deal. They would argue the Americans left the deal, so therefore the deal was broken. But simultaneously, while they're cheating, they've been claiming to the Europeans that they want to stay in the deal. So Iran essentially is trying to have its cake and eat it. The effect of this has been to uh, put Iran's economy into a bind. But what it hasn't done, extraordinarily, is either stop Iranian cheating or encourage the Iranians to come back to the table because the Iranians were, of course, waiting for the US presidential election. Donald Trump wasn't the only person opposed to the Iran deal. Israel also saw the agreement as a threat to its very existence. The Israelis would like nothing better than to have peaceful relations uh, with Iran. And in fact, until 1979, Iran was a, you know, at least a tacit ally of Israel and they, you know, the countries worked together on, on numerous activities. But when the um, revolutionary um, Islamic regime came to power in 79, one of the issues it had was, of course, the, the very existence of Israel. In fact, you'll see even today that um, you know, Iran's leaders cannot bear to use the term Israel and will refer to Israel as the Zionist entity and will you know, frequently denounce it um, and denunciations that aren't simply, you know, you're a bad country, but we will destroy you, we'll wipe you off the map. We intend to you know, ensure that uh, the Zionist entity no longer exists. Now, if you are the Zionist entity, if you are Israel, um, you take very seriously the idea of a country suggesting that genocide ought to occur, because that is what the Iranian suggestion is. They wish to wipe you know, the Jews out of the Middle East, essentially. Israel did oppose the Iran deal because Israel's belief was that um, Iran would first cheat, because Iran has a history of cheating. If you go back uh, you know, 15, 20 years, Iran had a, a secret nuclear program it hadn't revealed to the world, which was exposed back in 2003. And um, Israel has been of the belief that Iran has continued its uh, nuclear activities. It's trying to present it to the world about how Iran has acted in that regard. And it felt the terms of the deal were not strong enough. Back to Mohsen Fakhrasadeh, Iran's top nuclear scientist. Whilst we still do not know who was behind his assassination, on the surface, it looks like an attempt to damage Tehran's nuclear capabilities. But what if more was at play? Obviously, we don't know who uh, killed Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. Uh, the Iranians blame Israel. It's possible it would be Israel. It's possible it could be dissident Iranian groups who have uh, committed similar acts in the past. It's possible it could be you know, the Americans. You know, there, there are various options as to who uh, might have uh, been behind it all, even the Gulf states, something like that. However, what, what we can speculate about is what this meant. Now, it, it can mean you know one of two things, essentially. The first would be the simple reason, which would be this is designed to slow down Iran's nuclear program again, to make sure that there are delays in that program and that Iran's rush towards a nuclear weapon is you know, you know cut back a bit. That's the you know kind of on the surface uh, explanation. A deeper explanation would be that with the change in US administration, a message is being sent by whomever uh, to the Biden team to say, don't think that it's going to be plain sailing if you want to sign a nuclear deal. If the deal is wrong, um, other countries in the region or other forces are perfectly capable of taking action to protect their interests to prevent a bad deal from being the baseline from which nuclear activity is still allowed to continue in Iran. The question policymakers in the West are now posed with is this. What is the best way to preserve peace in the Middle East? Joe Biden will be under immense pressure from all sides to come up with an effective answer to this question. And it always has one place at the heart of it.
all debates around this question about whether wars will break out in the Middle East revolve around one country, and that is Iran. The reality is that Iran is the destabilizer in the region. It destabilizes its neighbors by um, uh, supporting insurgency movements within them, by supporting terrorist activity within them, by um, looking to influence uh, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Syria. It, of course, maintains a constant aggressive stance towards Israel. It has a great hostility further afield to the UK and the US. It is a country that is based around a revolutionary creed of radical Islam um, and which has never altered its you know, stance in, in 41 years of its existence in this regime. So the reality is that it is perfectly possible for a conflagration to start in the Middle East, but it will be because of Iran and Iran's activities that will happen. The best way, therefore, to stop uh, any war in the Middle East, or to, you know, to ensure that there is continued peace, is to make sure that Iran kept at you know, carefully under control and isn't allowed to destabilize its neighbors, isn't allowed to launch terrorist attacks against them, and isn't allowed to develop nuclear weapons that would upset not simply the balance of power in the region, but would also allow Iran to menace people much further field as well.